Welcome back and brace yourselves for our longest episode yet. That's because today I am joined by my friend Ryan Flaherty, where we discuss our top 10 spatial puzzle games. In reality, we're going to talk about roughly 25 games. And to top it all off, at the very end of this episode, I reveal the next title that Bytewing Games is publishing with a planned Kickstarter campaign of the second quarter of next year. My name is Nick Murray, and you are listening to the Bytewing Games Podcast. Well, today I am joined by Ryan Flaherty. Is that how you say your last name? <laughs> no, nah, it's Flaherty. Flaherty? Really? Oh, man. I don't know if maybe you, you probably told it to me like when we first met. <laughs> and then, yeah, I, I've just been butchering it in my mind ever since. So, Flaherty? Yep. Flaherty and Murray. Is that how I say it? Murray? Murray. That's actually how it should be pronounced. Is, is it really? <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I mean, if you think about it, there's an A in there and it should be Murray, but no, everybody says Murray, including my own family. So I guess we just killed our own, the A in our own names, but so it goes. <laughs> Anyways, I'm joined today by Ryan, my friend from Columbus, Ohio, which is where we met because I was in dental school while you showed up and started residency in Columbus as well. Uh, pediatric residency to be specific, right? Pediatrician. What, what would you call it? Yeah. Pediatric residency after medical school. Yeah. So pediatrician. Nice. Yeah. And that's uh that was a while ago. How, how much longer do you have there? Oh, I have so much time, man. My residency is <laughs> almost done. I'm, I'm done with residency in yeah. June of 2022. So only a couple more months of that, but then I applied for fellowship, which I find out the match soon in a couple weeks. Nice. Oh man. That's exciting. Yeah, I know you, you've you been uh, interviewing around. Is there anywhere you're hoping to go next? Uh, yes, but I won't say on public audio. I'll <laughs> but know later. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. We'll keep it at that. Well, uh, yeah, Ryan, it's, it's good to reconnect with you. It's been a while since I was in Columbus. I moved to Akron for a year, and now I've been over in Arizona for about a half year. So, yeah, it's been over a year and a half since we last game together which man it feels like way longer than that but we, i know man thank we were we were gaming me. together before the pandemic it feels yes. so long ago oh, man <laughs> that's true that's true yeah so uh well ryan nobody knows you in our podcast among our podcast listeners well there may be few who know you unrelated to this podcast but why don't you tell tell everyone a little bit more about yourself they know you're a, a pediatrician resident um, out of med medical school a few years ago and uh, obviously you like board gaming which is why we're here but share a little bit more about your past and your also your interest in, in games and such yeah so uh, I got interested in board gaming in like undergrad like end of undergrad that was probably oh geez that was seven years ago or so like 2014 ish um, and then my board game uh, collection kind of gradually grew at the beginning got interested with kind of like the the typical kind of intro ones like Catan and dominion and stuff like that ticket to ride um and then like rapidly grew my collection during residency like you and i were playing a lot of games that uh that i was just like acquiring them really quickly uh, and now i'm up over 300 um oh. i have always really enjoyed a good abstract strategy game I feel like as, as I've played more games, a lot of my gaming tendency has gone more towards like almost like uh, simultaneous play rather than like the, the less take that there is in a game, the more I tend to like it. <laughs> so this is like right, the perfect right. category for me for an episode. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, there's other reasons I, I thought of you for this episode as well. Today we're talking about our top 10 spatial puzzle games. Um, one of them being that you were the one who introduced me to both Capstone Games, the publisher, which has actually become one of my favorite publishers. I, I enjoy quite a few of their games. And you also introduced me to Pipeline. Uh, I think that was one of the first games you showed us from them, and that has spatial puzzle elements in it. You still have Pipeline? You bet I do. It may or may not show up on this list. <laughs> oh, good, good. We may or may not have some crossover then. I love it. Yeah, and... Uh, 
So I, I do remember you saying you, you liked those types of games. And I think this will be an interesting discussion today because fundamentally you and I enjoy very different uh, ends of the spectrum as far as board games go. Like I, I really enjoy mean games, <laughs> but like meanness with a purpose, you know, I don't like just, yeah, mindless, yeah. you know, take that. I, I prefer more like uh, tense and cutthroat and, um, you know, Games like Brass Birmingham or what are other games? The Estates. Have you played The Estates? That's from Capstone. Yeah, we played it together. Oh, we did. Okay. Man, that was so long ago. I know. It's, it's been a minute. Yeah, I remember you really like a lot of the cutthroat, like especially when it comes to like area control. Like you were a big fan of like Ethnos and Inish and yeah. things like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And so, um, yeah, I do like that end of it. And I know um, some of your favorite games include Reef. Is that is that still one of your most favorites? Yep. Yes. Reef. And what what else are some of your favorite games to give people some context? Oh, geez. It's a, such a shifting list. Uh, looking at the, <laughs> the, the stack right here next to me. Uh, I mean, like you said, like Capstone games is just knocking it out of the park, man. Like their whole Ride the Rails series are all phenomenal. I think my favorite oh, of yeah. those is the, uh, or not Ride the Rails series, the <laughs> Ride the Rails is my favorite of the series, but the, <laughs> the Iron yeah. Rails trilogy that's yeah, currently Rails. out. Uh -huh. Yeah, those are yeah, great. Those are sweet. Um, I mean, I like a lot of the, the kind of classic -y, like, uh, roll for the galaxy, uh, gizmos, uh, I love a good space space. Um, and I like a lot of the smaller games. Like, I think if for me, like the sweet spot is kind of like 30 to 60 minutes, but it goes much mm -hmm. over an hour. It's like, it's hard to convince a lot of, uh, people to play. And I feel like I've sure, shifted yeah. more towards like a, like a medium ish to light medium in terms of gaming. Yeah. Cause a lot of my gaming for people I play with a lot of my like co-workers and friends who are in residency and a lot of them like like board games to some degree but aren't like super heavy gamers like you or i and they're like right. it's hard to convince them to sit down and play a two or three hour game like a lisboa or something or a pipeline <laughs> like i honestly haven't even played pipeline since we played it just because it's hard mm -hmm. to convince someone to do that depth that that weight of a game for people who don't oh, yeah. play games that often but i mean i mm -hmm. love a good heavy game like uh i played lisboa a couple times and love it i think a lacerda is just such a clean elegant design but i'm kind of rambling but i like i, I feel like i'm a pretty uh good omni gamer i'll play anything once there's very few things i don't like ecos is pretty much one of the few things i actively dislike <laughs> <laughs> ecos yeah which is ironic because i feel like it's it's kind of in the realm of this exact topic and i hate it with a passion it's probably one of the least favorite things I've played in recent memory. Oh man, I'm actually curious. Um, yeah, I have I have not played Ecos, and this is a recent game. What did you not like about Ecos? Oh gosh, well Ecos, the one of the things that was hard to parse was just you have so much stuff to start with because you start yeah. with like eleven cards or something, and you can like always mm -hmm. constantly acquire them. I don't know. Yeah. I just felt like from the beginning, I didn't have a clear idea of what my strategy was going to be. And like, this is mm. me saying I actively hated it while winning it in a five player game. Like I had no <laughs> idea what I was doing and somehow I still yeah. won. And I just didn't like it at any point. Like the most fun part of it was me <laughs> playing bingo and like pulling the chips out of the bag and saying, does anyone have the water thing? Water, this is the element you get right now is water. I was like so bored with it. And I was like, so checked <laughs> out. Also it has like one of the cardinal sins of uh, each player takes their turn individually in order mm -hmm. and some person might be taking a turn and triggering like you have like cool card combos but like while one person is triggering like they're like five card combo everyone's just sitting around and watching and waiting and you might have 20 minutes of downtime in between your turns uh, oh, before nice. someone pulls a bingo thing and you're not necessarily triggering something with every pull so it's just painfully long and way overstated it's welcome for me at least <laughs> gotcha yeah, I, this is one that I kind of glanced at a little bit, but never, never really tried to, I don't know, look into more. But that's that's interesting to hear. I have played some bingo style games recently, and um, yeah, no, I mean I played yeah. some too, and some might even show up on this list today, and some that are very, very similar to Ecos actually, but <laughs> that there are things that are different enough that I like them significantly more. Gotcha. Cool. Well, yeah, there, there's some context to, to Ryan and, and some of his tastes in games. And, and so this will be helpful for our discussion, I think, which, as I mentioned, is we're going to talk about our top 10 spatial puzzle games. And so with this, a spatial puzzle, that's kind of 
uh, an abstract topic a little bit. Like it, it's not a very succinct topic, I guess I, I would say, because even if you look on Board Game Geek, which is the ultimate database for board games, they have mechanisms and families, and and everything's categorized in all kinds of different ways. And uh, they don't really have a spatial puzzle mechanism or category. So this is even outside the realm of, of what they've defined for boundaries of games. And uh, so really, when I, when I told you pick, pick your top 10 spatial puzzle games, I know I mentioned that spatial puzzles are basically, they're, a lot of times they're cards or tiles, but they can also be 3D, three-dimensional pieces, plastic, wood, whatever, that you are arranging or... Uh, putting together or stacking together uh, in in optimal ways. Usually, you have an open space. Maybe there's boundaries to this open space, but you have you have a space to arrange these things over time, and you're trying to do it optimally. And you know you'll you'll have lots of regrets if you do it poorly and you don't plan things out long term, typically. And you'll benefit greatly if you arrange things well. And so. That's a really generic definition of spatial puzzles, but maybe as we start throwing out some games, this will give people a more concrete idea of what we're talking about. And uh, so, yeah, we're going to go through our top 10 spatial puzzle games, and let's let's just start things off. Uh, have you ordered yours in any way? I haven't done it for mine, but have you done it with yours? Yeah. No, I had – it. honestly, it was kind of hard because they were, like, a good 13 or 14 games that I, like, thought of. I, I kind of went through, like, my collection and thought – Oh, does this thing fit in a spatial puzzle? And there were a couple that like immediately sprang to mind. Um, but as I was going through, I I had trouble ordering like where in the top ten and which ones like didn't quite make the cut. And so yeah. what I ended up doing is I like looked at what my BGG ranking was on like a one to ten scale. Go. But I also yeah. like didn't think that was an accurate representation of like the, it being appropriate for this list necessarily. Just because I like playing the game, so I actually like right. also gave it a weighting on how much I think it fits the spatial puzzle like criteria giving like a little bit more weight if it's like a little more vicious and cutthroat and like you could get messed up by other people or like by your own choices. Um, yes. And then like the total of that, I kind of like ranked it based on that. There were a couple that had like oh, the wow. same score, but uh, did it that way. And I didn't put anything on this list that uh, that I had ranked less than an eight on BGG. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. It sounds like you, you had a great selection there and really good uh, criteria for how you ordered these. So <laughs> my list is going to be, it's going to feel very different from yours, which, which is good. Maybe, um, mine's a pretty lazy, just tossed together. Like I, I thought of all the spatial puzzle games I've played. I listed them out and then I picked 10 and then I cheated. We're going to, we're going to treat this a bit like, like a cooperative game where if somebody cheats a little bit, if it's just a little bit, everyone's just kind of like, it's fine. We're on the same team. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I do have some cheats in here, like uh, more than 10 games or like two games for one, for one, or even I, a couple I, I have a little that... bit of a cheat too. And I think there'll be some interesting <laughs> good, good. Uh, arguments about whether or not some of my games are actually spatial puzzle games, but <laughs> okay. Okay. And that's fine. And yeah, there are actually a couple games I haven't even played. So I, I just put them on my top 10 based on me thinking they would make my top 10 or, also a little bit of like what what do the people think and like I, I did look at like what are some of the most popular spatial puzzle games and I did consider that as well because you know a lot of people take take some of my the games I toss out there as recommendations um, for better or worse <laughs> and so I tried to take that into consideration as well but anyways let's jump into it do you want to share your first uh, top spatial puzzle game Sure. I mean, it's already come up in this episode, us talking about it. I actually, ah. this is probably the the kind of oddball pick of the group that at first I was like, this isn't a spatial puzzle game. But the more I looked at and like reminded myself of the rules, The Estates is my number 10 by Class Ooh. Soak. Yeah. Wow. And like, the more you think about it, the more it's like, yeah, this actually kind of is a spatial puzzle game. Like, uh, yeah. you are making like stacks of things that are in descending numeric, or I don't remember if it's descending or ascending. I think it's like ascending in numerical order. Um, mm -hmm. but you're also making a spatial puzzle lengthwise in order to get a row long enough to even be considered for scoring. Um, but also like the way in which you draft the cubes to go for auction is also mm -hmm. a spatial puzzle because it can only pull from the sides and can't go from the middle. So when you pull which one is a spatial puzzle consideration. But the more I thought it, I was like, it's actually a pretty good spatial puzzle one. Um, it's yeah. just a little vicious for my liking. And oftentimes <laughs> the times I've played it, I mean, it always goes over well, but oftentimes I've played it where the the least negative score wins which is an odd thing to say for a board game but it's a yeah. good game 
Oh man. Yeah. That's, you make a good point. And, uh, if I had time to reconsider my top 10 list, I would have scratched one off and I would have put this one on it because I love the estates <laughs> precisely because it is like also so mean, but also so unique compared to a lot of other games that I've played where, <laughs> yeah, you can just put up a block for auction and, uh, you know, it's or somebody else puts up a block for auction and they know this is the most important block in the world to you and they're just trying to drain you of all your money and yeah that <laughs> closed economy is just it. brutal oh yeah and so it's like do i blow everything now for this really important block and then just scrape by for for multiple turns after that <laughs> or, or how do i handle this yeah the estates is great i showed it to uh some friends one time who <laughs> they're not really gamers it, we were doing a study group i think in dental school and uh i brought it along and i was like let's play this one <laughs> <laughs> and uh i showed it to him and at first and after we played it they were just like nick this is too much <laughs> they i think they weren't talking so much it's not a, a very complicated game but it's very opaque as far as like what should mm -hmm. i be doing and like what and uh, they caught on to it. And by the end of it, they're like, oh, okay, this is one of those games you got to play again after playing through it once to, to catch on. But <laughs> I learned that day that it's it's maybe not the right game to bring to people who are not gamers, you know? <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> mean, it's be... interesting because people don't off. I feel like the, the common, like, uh, I don't want to say layman, but like the, the stuff that people play like growing up, like the monopolies and sorries and troubles, there aren't really like auction games as part of that. So it's like a unique mechanism that not many people have played much of mm -hmm. to kind of introduce people to. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just the part of like, which block do I put up for auction? How much are these worth? And like, <laughs> how are things going to shape out as the game goes on? That's definitely something you learn as you play estates multiple times. So that's a great pick. I, uh, I love it. <laughs> what was your number 10? So... And mine is in no particular order, so I'm just going to start off with a, a double a double hitter. This is Patchwork and New York Zoo, because they're kind of similar in my mind, because they're both from the polyomino, polyomino master himself, Uwe Rosenberg. And Patchwork and New York Zoo are both about going around a rondelle to pick out what's the next polyomino piece you're going to put out in your own personal area. And Patchwork is all about building a quilt. New York Zoo is about breeding animals and filling your zoo as quickly as possible. Um, but Patchwork is a two-player game, and it's a very interesting mix of, of spending time and buttons and earning buttons with whichever tiles you choose and then trying to cover up negative points. And it's a tricky one. But I think it's a lot of fun. It comes in this, this dinky box with no insert, and you just dump all the tokens in there. But it, it's kind of charming in in a way as well. Whereas New York Zoo is a very nice production. It has tons of little animal figures, just over 100 <laughs> of animal figures, wooden animal tokens. And uh, you're racing to fill your area first. And the first person who fills it wins the game automatically and you can breed animals and if you fill an enclosure then that earns you a tile such as like a roller coaster tile or something to help fill your uh, your little spaces and cracks faster so i really like both games a lot they're two they're among two of my favorite polyomino games they're not the only polyomino games that i have on my top 10 spatial puzzles list i was gonna say and... i feel like i when i thought of you making your list but the game that we played together that's very polyomino uh, inspired possibly even by uh, Uwe Rosenberg himself, I figured would be on this list. It's a little bit heavier than Patchwork. Yes. Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> I think we're thinking of the same game and it will come up later. But I, I guess as far as family-friendly games go, I, I would recommend both Patchwork and New York Zoo. New York Zoo does have a few little weird rules to it that, that aren't the most elegant in the world. <laughs> but you catch on quickly. We got my mom into it and she enjoyed it. And then Patchwork we gave to my brother and brother-in-law and his wife and they've enjoyed it so both a couple solid entry level games in my opinion yeah and, and is my it, first pick isn't new york zoo that's a capstone too right yeah yeah i believe it released last year and uh yeah we're still enjoying playing this one it hasn't really dropped down in in my enjoyment of it and that's always a good sign yeah i feel like this is the part where we diverge pretty drastically because and i feel like i'm being a hypocrite because in a couple picks i have a polyomino pick but I, for the most part, actually really don't enjoy polyomino games. I never really have for whatever reason. I just 
Mm -hmm. For me, it just doesn't do it. Um, so why, why so, is that? Is there is there something about polyomino games that's just that you can put I your finger on, or I, yeah, I can't put my finger on why I don't like it. Like I I just didn't particularly enjoy Patchwork. Uh, I played it once years ago at this point, but I didn't particularly enjoy it. The game that'll come up later that we're hinting around, I didn't particularly enjoy. Um, <laughs> I don't know specifically yeah. what it is about polyomino stuff, but like with the the with the like the core of polyomino games of just like placing a polyomino on a like predefined grid just has never really done it for me. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. And this will be good because then people can have other options besides just straight polyomino recommendations from me. So <laughs> <laughs> what's your number two or number nine, I guess, whichever <laughs> order you're going in. Yeah, my number nine. So I ranked these, uh, the estates and uh, this one the same in terms of being an eight on BGG and both being oh, yeah. pretty equivalent in terms of like uh, being fairly, uh, mostly fitting the spatial puzzles genre. This is Tiny Towns by my good friend, uh, Peter McPherson. Mm -hmm. He was uh, mentoring me. Uh, I'm a budding board game designer and he did, uh, I did the mentorship program uh, through the board game design lab and he was my mentor for that. So He's oh, a super cool. cool dude, and I had to give him a shout out because this is also a perfect fit for this category. Uh, have you played Tiny yeah. Towns before? I have, yeah. I've played it multiple times. It's it's a solid game for sure. Yeah, I I, I struggled for a long time about whether or not this fit in the category because it's it's an interesting pick because in Tiny Towns it's that bingo style that we were talking about before, where mm -hmm. everyone kind of picks the same piece and you put a little cube out for like a resource, and then based mm -hmm. on the cards that come out for scoring conditions, you can turn those cubes in. Uh, if they're in a specific configuration polyomino style to put out a building in one of those spaces. So over mm -hmm. time, it becomes increasingly more of a spatial puzzle of what things you set yourself up for when, and you can choose when you pull off the cubes. You can set yourself up to do multiple configurations at once if you're clever about it, um, depending on mm -hmm. when people do uh, the the bingo calling. And there's two like different variants to play it. Um, there's like the more mean aggressive way you can play it, which is where each individual person goes around in, in a circle and picks one at a time. So you can kind of hate draft, if you will, the, the yep. bingo calling, um, totally. which I'm sure is your preferred way. And I think we played it that way <laughs> together. Um, I but so, I yeah. prefer the like simultaneous play where you can play this game with a hundred people and you just pull out cards and just like flip mm -hmm. it one at a time and everyone does the right. same one. And that's my preferred way in terms of like the simultaneous play and a little less hate drafting, but I, I understand yeah. the appeal of the hate draft. <laughs> yeah where you have to just kind of deal with whatever comes out of the deck i don't know if i ever played it that way actually um but yeah tiny towns is a good one it, it was very popular when it came out just a couple of years ago and i think it's still played pretty regularly among a lot of people um this one when you bringing this up it actually kind of reminds me i've never made this connection but it reminds me a bit of calico honestly have you played calico i haven't but i, I understand yeah. the reference yeah, so the reason these two games seem a little bit similar to me is in both games, you're kind of committing to placing something on a very specific space in a very restricted area of your board, which <laughs> I guess that's most spatial puzzle games that we'll be talking about today. <laughs> but um, things things really start to feel constricting to you as you as things go on. And, you know, if you place a cube in one space in tiny towns, that can become, has the potential to become a few different scoring options or building options down the road, depending on what you place next to it. Likewise with Calico, you can, you can place a, a pattern or a color out and you're trying to commit to maybe three of a color surrounding one spot or three of a pattern. And over time, <laughs> as you fill in the spaces around it, you, you start to regret having put something <laughs> somewhere else earlier. And uh, yeah, I think it's really tight. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a good pick. Good old tiny towns. Have you tried either of the, are there two expansions now? Have you tried any of them? Uh, I haven't tried either of the expansions yet now. Mm -hmm. Me neither. I've heard good things, but uh, yeah, there's tiny towns for you. That's another really good uh, family style one. I would say one that you can quickly teach people and get them into. So my next pick claims to be a family game, but I would argue that it's, that's not very family friendly, <laughs> although it looks the part and that is galaxy trucker. Have you, have you tried yeah. Galaxy Trucker before? I, I didn't consider this on the list, but yeah, no, I love Galaxy Trucker. I'm staring at it right now. No, it's a great game. But yeah, no, it totally yeah, fits because it's just a, it's a real time one. Yeah. This is one of those weird games that I really enjoy playing 
and I really get a kick out of it every time I play it. But I actually got rid of it from my collection because <laughs> I just got I got so tired of teaching it and uh, like relearning it. Um, and this is this is kind of my biggest complaint about the game is like there are just so many rules and like little fiddly elements, and then like the event cards that come out in the second phase. So you're you're, you're basically cobbling together this this galaxy truck of your own as quickly as possible by snatching tiles from the middle flipping them over looking at them and deciding whether you want to commit to them and how to arrange them it's kind of a real-time first phase and you cobble together this piece of garbage truck and uh before other people take all the good tiles and and the good positioning and stuff and then you get into the second phase and you, you're just clinging on for dear life as your truck is sent around space and has to encounter these different challenges and uh, hopefully survive and, and score you some points by the end instead of just being blasted to smithereens, which <laughs> also happens. <laughs> um, but even when when both, uh, you know, I've ex- I've been on both ends where my my truck was unscathed and I just felt like a champion, and I've been on the other end where my truck just got blasted to smithereens <laughs> and I had no chance of winning the game. And uh, it, it was fun either way, honestly. The the part that kills me is just like. There's just so many little rules to the game. When you're trying to, uh, I think, onboard somebody to this game, it's just a pain. And then when you haven't played it in a while, remembering all the events and what they do is also a pain. And I, and I was hoping, I got rid of this, hoping that the new version of Galaxy Trucker that they just came out with, kind of a revised copy, would be more streamlined and easier to teach. But apparently it's it's basically just like a slightly smaller box and a couple tweaked rules. But overall, pretty much just as just as crazy and and complicated as it was before. But this is one of those games where if somebody who knew how to play was like, Hey, you want to play with me? I'd be like, heck yes, I'm there. So there's galaxy trucker. Yeah. My favorite part of galaxy trucker. I've only played it once and I've been meaning to replay it. Um, My favorite part was that I was like just rushing the game the whole time. So like we would do the real time part and then whoever finishes first and it's done drafting tiles flips a timer and flips it twice. And then once the timer is done flipping, everyone else can no longer draft anything. So people are like sure. frantically grabbing tiles. I'm just like grabbing like whatever like piecemeal works. And once it's like, nah, it's good enough. I just like flip the timer, like, like, like chaos ensue. And it was the best yes. part. Oh man. Yeah. And then you like look back and you're like, what have I done? Or there's, <laughs> there's times where people aren't careful and they, they put together a bad truck or like one that's illegally mm-hmm. connected. And so then it's like, all right, we have to take off everything that's technically not connected. <laughs> it was like a whole portion then, like, of their ship. Yeah, before phase two even starts, before they're even flying, half their truck is already gone, and <laughs> that's yeah. pretty funny. So yeah, yeah or they like, uh, or they build all of these cool parts that like need power, and they don't have anything to power their ship, and you're like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh man, what a game. Yeah, it's a good one though. I think I think uh, it deservedly has been a classic for a long time. It's just. Not as streamlined as I would prefer, but still one that's great for a, a group, especially if they know how to play and don't have to deal with the, the learning part. So there's my second pick, Galaxy Trucker. Yeah, no, that's a great one. Uh, yeah, my number eight, uh, again, already came up. Uh, one of the first ones I thought of is Pipeline um, yes. by Ryan Courtney and by uh, Capstone. Uh, I think this is one of the first games that got me intrigued with capstone i think this and like irish gauge were, like the first two that i saw that i was like oh capstone's like got it going um and they just like <laughs> have like never hit the break since um yeah. but I, it's a little lower on my list a because it's just heavy and hard to get to the table i remember it took us sure. like a long time just to even figure out the rule book um <laughs> when we, we both played it for the first time together but yep. the other thing is like the whole game isn't entirely uh the spatial puzzle like yes it's an aspect of it but like a lot of the ones that are higher like the entire game is just the spatial puzzle whereas this one in pipeline mm-hmm. you're basically making the reason it's called pipelines because you're making oil pipelines of uh silver or like gray blue and orange and depending on how long your pipe is that's how much refining you can do of the oil and it's more like an economic game with some spatial puzzles like a side thing um and there's yeah. a little bit of a spatial puzzle with like the the board itself of actions but that's not as much a spatial puzzle thing um and it's like a whole side thing of like extra actions you can do um that are the the bonuses or whatever um so i I think that makes it a little less spatial puzzly than some of the other ones but it was one of the first things i thought of with making the this intricate like tut like tube map um that it had to be at least on this list plus it's got eono tool artwork so how can you not love it yes oh it's so crisp like 
I, I have no interest in oil, but somehow you know tool makes pipeline just so sexy, you know, and like so so uh, interesting. And uh, yeah, this is on my list as well. Great pick. Um, pipeline has an interesting style of spatial puzzle that I've never seen before. Trying out pipeline, um, as you mentioned, it has these domino tiles with basically these pipes that go through it, three, three different pipes. There's like two short ones, one long one, and there's different combinations of, of where they enter and exit this domino tile. And then on top of that, there's three different colors. And so there's just a huge combination. There's probably like 135 or more different unique tiles that you can make just out of three different colors and three pipes and then several ways that they connect and wind and turn and stuff. And so what comes out of that is is very satisfying, especially for people like you say, who like uh, heavy economic games, but also like spatial puzzles. This is that Venn diagram. I have two games like this, I think on my list where uh, very satisfying for heavy gamers who also love spatial puzzles. So that's a good one. I, I did pre-order, I haven't received it yet, but I pre-ordered the, the expansion to pipeline them from oh, Capstone. Oh, I didn't know there was an expansion coming. Yes, yes. Well, I think it's pretty... Like um, it adds, <laughs> it's, I don't, it adds a, a whole bunch of subtle things. It, it's one of those subtle expansions that adds like different goal cards, I think, or what, what is that? The, the final bonuses that you can lay out. Mm -hmm. It adds, I think it adds different upgrades that you can go for. And then like, I think it, it increases the challenge of the game. Honestly, I think I read somewhere Ryan Courtney saying that like, yeah, for people who, who need a little more challenge or a little more variety to pipeline. This is, this is one to go for. So, oh, that's so yeah, funny. This... I, I can't imagine pipeline needing to be more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you've, if you know much about the, the design history of this, I think when Ryan pitched it to, to capstone initially, it was just this sprawling brain melting monstrosity. And, uh, <laughs> and they, they actually really aggressively cut down a lot of the mechanisms and cut out a lot of things and some of these expansions, I know he, he has multiple expansions in the in the pipeline. <laughs> and uh, and a lot of these are adding back some of those elements that were just too complicated to put into the initial board game. So, um, And yeah, speaking of, of complicated pipey goodness, the other half of this, this part of my list, this is another dual <laughs> game. Curious Cargo is his follow-up. Um, this one is probably not... Well, you, you do like spatial puzzles, but this one's probably a little meaner. And way, have you tried Curious Cargo? No, I, I heard kind of some mixed reviews about it. Uh, and it's also like two player only, which I don't play as yeah. much two players. I play a lot of like sure. three or four. So it just yeah. hasn't gotten to be of interest yet. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure we would have played it if, if you know, we would have been around. But uh, this is one definitely more polarizing than Pipeline. And I think it's because... <laughs> Uh, Ryan said about this game that uh, he tried to cram as much complexity into a small box as possible. And on top of that, you're drawing tiles out of the bag and then you just kind of have to deal with what to do with them next. Like you're always hoping you get a specific tile and it never comes out. And so you're like having to, to adapt and reevaluate and use those tiles in, in different ways, maybe other than what you intended to, to score points. And so this one, uh, as, spatial, as far as spatial puzzle goes, this one's probably one of the most brain burning on my entire list. And uh, some people really love it. Others do not like it. <laughs> so you got to kind of know what, what you're getting into if you, if you give Curious Cargo a go. But um, yeah, I, I really like both games, which is why they're in my top 10 as kind of a dual recommendation. So there you go. Um, and I guess... You said pipeline, and I inc included pipeline on my list, so it's going to be back to you. All right. So this was uh, where there are really three different options of this game, and I picked my favorite version of it. Um, that I think also is the most spatial puzzly of them. I think as the sequels went, it got more spatial puzzly, and that's the Azul franchise. Um, yes. And so, yes, Azul has a like the base Azul has a little bit of spatial puzzliness, but Eventually, if you're good enough, you can get a lot of the rows and columns eventually anyway, and it's less spatial puzzly. The -hmm. second one has a little bit more of a spatial puzzle because you're going the stained glass of Centric because you're like going yes. in a sequential order and when you jump forward and when you reset is uh, meaningful. But I personally mm -hmm. prefer Summer Pavilion as my favorite. I remember we yeah. deferred on that pretty heavily whenever we <laughs> played it 
uh, initially, yeah. but it's a lot more forgiving of the three for sure. Cause you can set four mm -hmm. aside in the corners of your board and you can bank them for later. It's also got wilds yeah. to be a little more forgiving as well. But I kind of prefer that because it lets you plan ahead. Cause if you see that in round three, blue is going to be wild then you might take some blue in the first round, bank them in the corner and use it in round three. So that's it for a little bit of planning. But the part that makes it the best part for the spatial puzzle is the Azul, if you've never played it, what are you doing listening to this podcast? But basically you like <laughs> that you put in little hops, little uh, discs, four, di four little uh, pieces. You take all of one color and push everything into the middle and you do that until all the pieces are drafted. Well, the part that makes this the interesting part is you uh, dump the pieces onto your board but you can get specific, like I feel like the order of when you cash different colors in matters more in this game than in the other two. Because the part of this is if you enclose a specific symbol, there are three different symbols. There's like the statue and two other statue things. Um, right. If you enclose them entirely, you get a bonus. And one of the bonuses can be like drafting a tile out of the like unused pile. And at that point, you put it on your board immediately, and then you can chain that into more bonuses. So the the or you might chain that to set up the thing that you're about to play on the board. So the the order in which you do this spatial puzzle matters. Whereas in the other two, mm -hmm. it's not really as much. It's more just like the drafting of it. Um, so for this, I thought this was a, a more appropriate one for this one, and I love this version of it. Yeah, that's a great choice. Summer Pavilion. I think I think a lot of gamers tend to prefer Summer Pavilion for the reasons you say. You know, there's there's uh, more opportunity for planning and combos, and a, a bit of a wider decision space as far as what to take and where to place it and when to place it. So I do I do think that's a great choice. I do enjoy Summer Pavilion, and uh, actually that's that's funny because the very next one on my list after Pipeline, which you already mentioned, is Azul. So we're just on the same <laughs> wavelength right now, but. Uh, yeah, I chose regular Azul, and I did do a kind of an article into this, like which Azul is best according to me. <laughs> um, and I I concluded that the original is my favorite, and you know Summer Pavilion was second uh, for the reasons you mentioned. But I like original Pazul, Azul, yeah, because it's it it focuses more on getting into each other's minds, and it'll it because it's simple. It's simpler as far as like, what color should I take and where's it going to go? And it's a little more predictable as far as what other people need as well. Mm -hmm. Then it, it, I guess it focuses even more pressure and tension on the drafting aspect where I, I have to get into my opponent's minds and kind of think, okay, what are they most likely to take next? And then how can I take advantage of my prediction of how they're going to behave? And, uh, I I'm very satisfied. That's probably one of those <laughs> satisfying feelings in gaming when I when I predict or I get in somebody's head and I kind of read their mind and then I take advantage of of kind of the way they play and uh, and then when it pays off, that's so satisfying. So I love with the Zool that I can I can like put off a certain color drafting that color because I know they're not going to take it yet. They're going to want this one more, and so I take a different color or I take the color they want, and then mm -hmm. I know that mine is still safe for the next go around. And uh, when it pays off, it's just, oh, chef's kiss. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the spatial puzzle part, this is, as you say, less of a spatial puzzler, but absolutely a, a stone cold classic, any form of Azul. I am looking forward to the new version, the newest edition, which hasn't hit the US yet, but it's called the Queen's Garden. That one looks like even more of a gamery style Azul. Mm -hmm. And I've heard it can be mean, so we'll see. We'll see how you and I fall on on that next <laughs> one. But uh, yeah, it looks very interesting. Yeah, no, that's great. <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, Azul is my my next one. So what is your next one? Yeah, so mine. This is where I have two games, and uh, I played both of them today back to back just to to refresh myself because one of them is brand new, and I just got it in the mail like a week ago. And then one of them I've had for a while, and I think is very criminally underrated for how good it is. So my pick is, uh, this is the, the only polyomino game really on my list of games, is Number Nine and Llama Land. So Number Nine is uh, by uh, someone I've never even heard of, uh, Peter Wickman. Um, but Llama Land is Philip Walker Harding, which I'm sure will be on your list at some point later. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the point of these is that it's polyomino stacking. Um, and I thought this pretty uh, classically embodied the the spirit of this episode number nine is just so clean and simple and perfect um it it does what it needs to do it's a great filler weight 
it's very, very light. Like the, the rule book is a page front and back, um, but literally you just have numbers zero through nine and you're stacking them on top of each other. They have holes in them and it's, you have to have them perfectly overlay and they have to overlay at least two pieces. The number that they are is in the shape of their number. So the zero is in the shape of a zero with a hole in the middle. The one is a one with a hook to the left. And basically all you have to do is stack them to where they are having no holes underneath them. And the, the base level of just having them on the table is level zero. So it's a zero multiplier times whatever the number is. Whatever you can mm -hmm. stack on top of them is the layer one. And that's one times whatever the number is. And that's how many points you get. And however many layers mm -hmm. you can stack it up is how many points times how what the actual number is. So if you can stack a, n a number nine on the third level, that's 27 points. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes you can get uh, most of them on level one. You can get a few on level two. And maybe if you're clever, you can get one, maybe two on level three. But oftentimes that's pretty hard to do. Um, like the game we just played today, I got like maybe three or four on the th on the second level and the rest were on like my first or zero level. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, depending on when stuff comes out, and this is also a bingo game too. So the each of those numbers, zero through nine, they each come out twice and it's a bingo style where you flip a card, everyone does it. Uh, and it also plays solo, which I love. Um, it plays also, in like 15 to 20 minutes a... with teach. Okay, it's not a shared space. So you're all working on your own. Yeah, uh, both of these oh, games okay. are, are your own individual space. Okay, um, okay, okay. And, Yeah, and Llama Land is right. similar, but it's definitely the more gamery of the two. Like Llama Land took probably a, an hour, hour and a half with teach and setup and tear down and everything. And you're mm -hmm. also having polyominoes. This is like traditional polyominoes, like a T and uh, a U and a W and things like that. So yeah, it's yeah. And like a cross. Um, but basically the, the thing with that is you like depending on what you cover is what resources you get. There's like three different main resources, corn and uh, beans, there's coins. You can get workers that give you special abilities once per turn. Like you can turn a cacao into a corn or you can turn a corn into a coin. Or if you cover all three of the corn, cacao and beans, you get two coins. And uh, you can turn in four of a resource to get uh, an end game victory point card. And then the, the crux of why it's called Llama Land is because whenever you take a victory point card, uh, it's like four resources for a llama. And then you take a little llama figure that's adorable, a little llama meeple, and you put it on your board somewhere. And then once it's on your board, you can't cover the llama anymore. So it restricts your board space a little bit, but you can literally expand it as wide as you want. There's no boundaries to your llama land. Um, and yeah. I just thought it lasted a little too long for, for what it was doing. Like maybe the last like 15, 20 minutes, the game was already kind of decided. Um, and it was just kind of like going through the motions. Uh, yeah. I think if it had been trimmed down a little bit, a little less decision space, a little more tight, I think I would have liked it a little bit more. But number nine mm -hmm. is just such a clean, simple filler weight game that does what sure. it needs to really well. And it takes the best part of Llama Lamp, just stacking the polyominoes, and that's the entire game of number nine. So that's my number six pick. Nice, nice. Yeah, both of these games I've heard about, never tried them, but they both look interesting to me. And I'm, I'm looking at pictures and... I do like those little llama figures. <laughs> um, but yeah, good good picks. I'm, I'm glad we got a relatively new one on here because it's well, I've got a couple of new I've... ones on here. I try, I, I try oh, to sweet. keep with the hotness on this list. That's right. We got to we gotta keep up with the the kids these days. <laughs> <laughs> Who's, who am I kidding? I'm still a kid, so at heart. Um, yeah, so along those lines, though, I, I also picked another. <laughs> this is another dual pick here I, I did a lot of cheating with this top 10 list i think there's like 13 or 14 games on here but <laughs> it's fine they're, they're kind of similar in my mind and and still solid on either direction so this is another relatively accessible pick um little a little bit lower on the spatial puzzle complexity a lot lower actually so good good entry level but a couple of classics my pick is both Carcassonne and Isle of Sky. So both of these games feature square tiles that you are arranging together in a obviously specific way. You're trying to match up terrain next to each other and, and features and such. And I know with Isle of Sky, you can, I believe you can kind of just do it however you want, but if you do it poorly, then you're going to suffer. Whereas with Carcassonne, you actually have to, you have to align proper edges with each other like grass with grass and city with city and stuff but uh they're they're quite different in how they play out despite having a similar appearance and, and base 
components, I guess. Because Carcassonne uses a shared space. You All you do is, I think, just draw one tile from... It's been a while since I played. Too long, actually. I still own this game, though. I really like it. Um, you draw a tile from the pile, and when it gets to your turn, you decide where to place it. And then if you want, you can add one of your... One of your meeples, one of your figures on top of that tile as well onto one of the features, whether it's a road or you lay it down as a farmer or you stand it up in a city, whatever. And you're trying to score points with where you place these tiles and your meeples. And so this one's actually really cutthroat and nasty, <laughs> which is why <laughs> I like it for such a, a long-term classic. This is one that I'd say you could play with young kids. You could play with any, you know, any range of gamer and it's, it's quite enjoyable in my opinion. Whereas Isle of Sky has a little bit more going on with it, a few more mechanisms, and uh, you're building out your own personal little area of tiles. And there's also an auctioning phase of sorts, or kind of an eye cut you choose phase, where you draw three tiles out of the bag, you decide how to price them, you decide to kill one of them, <laughs> maybe one that other people really want or that you think won't be valuable to uh, sell off. And then... You, you take turns buying one tile from somebody else, and if nobody buys your tiles, then you're going to have to pay for them what you price them at. And so mm -hmm. I do really like that uh, I cut you choose and pricing your own stuff mechanism, and it's got a cool scoring thing as well where it's like uh, you have four different random scoring c conditions, and each round a different one triggers, and then it's a different combination of the two that will trigger in later rounds or three. And so it's just – Pretty satisfying little game, um, both of them, Carcassonne and Isle of Sky. Uh, very easy to get newcomers into, so that's my next pick. Nice. Yeah, I haven't played Isle of Sky, and I didn't particularly enjoy Carcassonne, but it's been a long time since I played it. I tried to play it on BGA like a week or two ago and with one of my friends back in Texas, and I just I still bounced off of it, so I think I need to get rid of it. <laughs> it's on my, my shelf of getting rid of you just got to be meaner when you play it, and then it's so satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you you're you kind of competing for the area majorities of, like, roads and cities and stuff. And, and you can't – it's interesting because you can't add a meeple to a feature that already has meeples in it. But you can add a meeple to, like, a separated feature and then connect them to each other later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or if somebody's trying to complete – a city or a feature you can just keep extending it to where it's hopeless for them to complete it and be able to score on it so there are some some subtly mean things you can do in that game and so that you know warms my heart <laughs> what's your next pick uh this is probably the most controversial of my picks but i feel like i never hear anyone talk about it ever and i am the champion for this game and that is game of thrones hand of the king by uh the illustrious bruno katala um, oh, I nice. love this game and it is technically uh, on the box. It says it's a two to four player game, but I think that's nonsense. It is a two player game cut and dry. <laughs> um, it, it is a great two player game and it is kind of the inverse of everything we've talked about so far in that mm. uh, this is a spatial puzzle by removal of tiles as the game goes on. And it drastically restricts your decision space as the game goes on as well. Uh, basically okay. it, the, the game of Thrones theme is really kind of, it's not worthless. You could have easily themed it as a color and it would have been just as valid, but it does help it with a little bit of the thematic tie because basically what you're doing, if you've never played it, which probably most of you haven't, you can get it for like nope. 10 bucks at Walmart, at least if you used to. Um, basically it is, you lay out in a grid. I think it's like an eight by eight grid or a seven by seven, uh, all these different squares. And each square has on it one of the people from Game of Thrones from one of the different houses. And there are basically seven houses. And so you have like House Stark, House Targaryen, House Lannister, um, and House Baratheon. And each one has a different number of people in it. So like House Stark is the biggest house. It has like seven people and there's something in the game. You have like Arya and Sansa and everybody. Um, and each person is its own individual tile. Well, the whole thing is as the game goes, you literally take a tile and then from where the most recent one was taken, the next person has to go in a line either along the row or column that you just selected from. And that's where mm. they take their next one. So it's a perfect two player game because you have a lot of planning and decision space and deep decision space because you're doing like double, triple think down the road of, oh, if I take this one, they'll probably take this one and then I'll take the next one and they'll take that one. Oh, but if I take this one, then they have to take this one. And then, oh, I've already taken a bunch of ones from this row. So they really can only take from the column and it just makes it a lot tighter and meaner. And, but the whole point of the game is if you have the majority of the people for that respective house, you take the banner from that house. And that's where it has that thematic tie-in. 
So if there's like whatever seven or eight target or seven or eight Starks, and you take whatever five Starks, you're guaranteed to have that banner. What makes it a little more unique as well, that makes it a little less solvable um, from that aspect, is whoever takes the final person from that house. So once uh, the other, so say there were six Starks, I don't remember how many there are, but if there were seven Starks and you already had six and I take the seventh one, I, I might not take it because I want the Stark banner, but because once the final person from the house is removed from the board, you get one of a special couple of abilities of like mercenary people, essentially, like the Hound is one uh, or uh, whatever. There's different people that do special one-time abilities like Brienne of Tarth. And those people can do special things like Jon Snow. I think one of them can like remove two people from like from the game. So like if you've already claimed uh, two of the four Baratheons and I have two of the Baratheons and, but you already have the banner, you have to get the majority to take it. So if I can remove one of your Baratheons out of the game, I now have the majority, but you can't do anything about it because hmm. all the Baratheons are gone. And so the, the special abilities allow for a lot of swinginess between the banners. Um, and the game stops whenever nobody, whenever the person can't pick because there's nothing in the row or column to pick from. Um, and so it makes it a really tight game at the end. Uh, and it's always kind of a nail biter as it goes. It's got a lot of good catch up swinginess that I really enjoy. And it's vastly underrated in my opinion. Yeah. I imagine this one is just like with all the, different game of thrones type games out there this one's just been buried by its own <laughs> <laughs> ip um but yeah that's interesting i'm looking at pictures here and and uh yeah i can see that being a very tight uh back and forth drafting style game and that's cool though that's that's a good pick so we're getting obscure and we're getting new i love it this is great. <laughs> <laughs> so my next one uh, after a couple light picks, Azul, Carcassonne, Isle Sky, we're jumping right back into the deep end with my other heavy hitter, A Feast for Odin. Is this the one we were, were hinting at earlier? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, because I taught you this game, and I was like, oh, you're going to love this. This is, like, not mean, and it's and it's heavy, and it's got spatial puzzles, but I guess the, I, it'll be interesting to hear what didn't click for you. But I love A Feast for Odin. I, I've played several Uwe Rosenberg games now. And this one, um, this one was probably actually one of my first, believe it or not, despite it being just a sprawling mess of, of spaces <laughs> and, and tiles. But uh, it remains one of my favorite because in A Feast for Odin, <laughs> it's it's like a polyomino addict's dream. You can just, you can just <laughs> feast on those polyomino, tiny polyomino tiles as you build them up. But it's not just about covering spaces, although it is because your, your board starts out with like negative 70 points. <laughs> but uh, it's also about building an engine. You, you, you choose tiles that surround certain spaces, and once they're completely surrounded, you earn whatever that space shows for the rest of the game. Or you're trying to cover up spaces, including the income track, but you got to cover up the spaces to the left and below that before you can cover up that income space to increase your income. And so there's engine building, there's there's oodles of worker placement and oodles of polyomino goodness in this spatial puzzler. And uh, this is one that I've played quite a few times now, and I'm still exploring the strategies and trying crazy things like just getting an island board super early and taking on way more negative points and hoping I can fill it all by the end. But it's cool how, like, I think there's like six or seven rounds that you play, and in round four or five you're like, there's no way I can cover this all. And then in round six and seven you're just you're – just, getting tiles from every direction and you're like i can do it <laughs> and then usually you cover up most of them and as long as you don't mess up your planning too much because this is one that's it, it's certainly i mean it's a worker placement game you can get in each other's way but there's so many options and so many paths you can take and and detours that you can follow if you need to that you can usually accomplish what you want to the fun is in exploring those different options and i don't know just it's like one of those co cozy Sunday games that you want to sit down and play for three hours. <laughs> That's a feast for Odin. Yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like, I, Grant, I only played it the one time with you, but I definitely got lost in all of the vastness of it because there's so many worker placement mm -hmm. spots and so many things you can do. And I had just yeah. heard so much about the game before I did it and how like interesting and unique like the whaling was, for example. So I was like, oh, let me just try and like do like, like let, let me just commit to a strategy. I'm going to do like whaling. And I did it for like <laughs> a time or two. But as, much, as many worker placement spots as there were, 
I didn't really feel like a lot of them, like, like, yes, there may be like whatever 50 worker placement spots, but not all 50 are created equal. And there are a couple that are like yeah. definitely superior to the others, or there are like some that are like an inferior version of the same exact space. Um, mm -hmm. And there's only like a couple that can do whaling, like two or three. And so yeah. like, I remember you specifically were like blocking me from doing whaling. And I was like, that's all I want to do. <laughs> so savage. <laughs> and, yeah. and so like, I feel like it actually was having a significant amount of blocking with the worker placement, which mm, I do enjoy yeah. worker placement. Like I love underwater cities. It's one of my top favorites, but like, I don't know. I feel like as much as it's touted as you can do anything, I felt like it was still pretty restrictive. Um, I also mm. don't, I've never liked the Agricola must feed your people at the end of the, the <laughs> era, which is still a piece yeah. for Odin. Um, Definitely. I don't know. I, I feel like I also miss, uh, I, I underestimated how important like the sideboards were. Like, I, I think I got one, like, way too late, and you had already gotten, like, through your second one, and you were just, like, crushing oh, yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, like the uh, the storage house and, and even the islands and stuff. Yeah, there's – those are – it's it's interesting because I, I, I've learned after playing it multiple times, like, oh, this board is really good. If you just have a bunch of extra tiles that are not the highest quality and you can't put them out on your main board, you got to go for these sideboards so you can put these to use or, like – I don't know. There's there's a lot of, of uh, breadth to explore in this game, and uh, I hear it's a good solo game as well. I usually just play it with Camille and I because it takes up our whole table with just two players. But um, yeah, there's there's my next pick, a feast for Odin. All right. Yeah. So the next one, let's keep with the hotness. Uh, the next two games actually were just released this year, um, and are both pretty popular already, or at least one of them is very popular. It's actually, I was looking online because I was curious. As I was making my list, I was like, man, so many of these are just abstract strategy games. And I was like, I, mean, I went online on BGG and I was like, what's, what are the top rated like abstract strategy games? Azul was number mm -hmm. one. This is number two. And Azul Summer Pavilion was three. But number two is Cascadia, oh, uh, which okay, yeah. I, I just played. And I really enjoyed. So this is what I was alluding to earlier with Ecos. Ecos and Cascadia mm -hmm. are very similar in that you are placing hexagonal tiles uh, with a boundless board. Um, but this is, you have your own individual space as opposed to Ecos, which is a shared board. Um, mm -hmm. But the Cascadia board, you uh, are, are basically picking from one of four uh, available tiles out in the the, the array, uh, in the market rather. Um, market's a poor choice to not buy anything. But you have mm -hmm. four tiles and the tiles either have one uh, like biome or habitat, um, or it has two biomes with like a line down the middle essentially. Um, right. and then you can put these in your like sprawling display. Um, the scoring is pretty simple. Uh, at the end of the, the game, whatever the, the biomes that connect like very like planet related. It's so, like the people I played with kind of related the three of those games together, Cascadia planet and, uh, Ecos, um, each with like varying degrees of, uh, difference. But, uh, with Cascadia, the, the part that's interesting to it is that a, the artwork is gorgeous. It's by Beth Sobel. She did a phenomenal job. Um, and it's got like realistic like animals on the artwork, which is gorgeous. But each animal has one of four scoring conditions for that individual animal and one scoring condition is used for the game. There's like five animals, like bear, like brown bears, salmon, uh, eagles, and like two other things, uh, foxes and elk. Um, and so you basically there's a animal above each of the four tiles. There's four animals available in four tiles and you take an animal and tile that are associated with each other and you put those on the board and each tile has yes two biomes but they can also have an animal on it or multiple animals that are able to be placed on it um and the ones that are like a single biome have uh one animal that can only go on it um, and when you do you get like a special like leaf token that you can then later on a subsequent round you can take a tile and not the associated animal and an animal from a different associated tile so you can pick and choose the ones that are most strategic for you. And it's got a lot of like typical like uh, tile scoring stuff of like the salmon is like if you have a contiguous run or uh, the elk one I had was like the with however many elk were like around you scored or uh, whatever, like paired like eagles that were two spaces away exactly. And so there's just like some interesting scoring and it was a great like good abstract strategy and like your own spatial puzzle of like, Oh, if I put the, the salmon here, well, then I can put the, the biome matches this biome over here for the elk, but I need the elk to be specifically here so I can make it match the other elk for the scoring. So it just had a nice bit of uh, scoring complexity. Uh, the, the reason it's a little bit lower is just because there was a, a decent bit of luck, uh, more so than it seemed at first blush. 
like me, I, I played a four player game of it. Um, and me and the person, two people behind me um, or in front of me, however you view it, uh, both of us were going for elk. Uh, there's only a finite number of animals in the game. And so because each of us were going for elk, the people on either side of us couldn't really go for elk very hard in their snoring because we just happened to get lucky that when it came out, we would take it. And then eventually by that point, it's really not worth it going into elk because we went so hard into the elk. And so depending on what comes out when, you might be less able to pick the things you want for your scoring and you have to adapt a little bit, but it's such yeah. a good game that I thought it was perfect for this list. Absolutely. Yeah, I know uh, Kyle is another regular on this podcast and he, he enjoyed Cascadia as well. And so I've heard good things about it from, from multiple different people. It's one that uh, I would, I think I really enjoy trying. I just haven't convinced myself to buy it personally, but it's one that like, as soon as somebody's like, Hey, you want to try Cascadia? I'm like, heck yeah, I do. Let's try this out. <laughs> so great choice. Wow. I can't believe, yeah, it's ranked number two on the abstracts category already. Yeah. That's it insane. only came out a few months ago. It's crazy. Just rocking it up there. So yeah, I think flat out games and Beth Sobel are just killing it with their, uh, latest offerings so very cool good choice my next pick <laughs> this is a this is another one that that's hot and it's fairly new it released board game geek says 2019 but it's actually a 2020 game that is isle of cats <laughs> um <laughs> i picked this because it's so dang popular right now even though i haven't played it and uh this is one where you <laughs> I'll, I'll read you the, the theme here, which is kind of funny. So <laughs> you'll be rescuing cats from the evil Lord Vesh by cramming them onto your boat board. Um, <laughs> you're trying to just cram these cats on your boat before, I guess, they get taken out by, by this evil person. But I'm sure that doesn't really come through in the actual game. In the game, you just have these different shaped polyomino tiles with cats on them that are sh stretched and splayed out as cats do in polyomino shapes, of course. And... Uh, you're fitting them onto a uh, kind of oval or like imagine a ship shape uh, board and uh, you're drafting cards as well. Like it, it has this weird combination of card drafting and, and tiling that's um, and, but also it has a family version for what I understand where uh, you can kind of cut out, I think the drafting completely and just do some pure simple tiling and which I think appeal to certain people. So yeah, not much to say about it, but that it's really popular right now. A lot of people love it, and so it's definitely one to keep an eye out for. Isle of Cats. Yeah, I thought the uh, the the theme was almost just like Noah's Ark, but with cats. Is basically my my <laughs> lame understanding of Isle of Cats. Yeah, that's. I I don't think you're too far off there, actually. So. <laughs> yeah, the, I will say though, Isle of Cats easily has the best marketing uh, strategy of any board game I've seen recently, which is the inside cover of the board game, like the box of it says like, uh, like cats sit here essentially. Oh, yes. And it's because it's yeah. a box cats. If they fit, mm -hmm. they sit and they just go and sit. And there's like so many pictures on like social media when it first came out of just cats sitting in the box, like the, the lid of the box of this game. And that was like the marketing strategy. And I was like, that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. I hear the the creator, which I think he's the publisher and designer and partially the artist, at least Frank West is, is very passionate about this game, a stand-up guy, and I think he's he's put in a lot of work to uh, to make this game as big as it is, and, and a lot of kind of thought and subtle subtle uh, Easter eggs like that into this game, and I think that's gone a long way to to get a lot of people's attention and for this enjoyable polyamino game. So, yeah, I, I've seen those pictures too. <laughs> All right, what's your next one? Uh, my next one's the last of the hotness and this one I, I it only just came out recently I, I was at origins since i'm in columbus origins is here in columbus and uh i was hoping it would have been at the the capstone games booth and it wasn't yet and i've been looking forward to this for a long time because it's such a good clean uh abstract strategy spatial puzzle um, and that's mm -hmm. savannah park which is a kramer and keesling mm -hmm. game that just came out um and i just got it in the mail last week played it today for the first time as a solo oh. game just to see if it would uh fit in this because i knew i would like it a lot i wanted to make sure i actually like liked it before i like advertised it on this podcast um yeah, and yeah. it was just as good as i expected it to be now granted this is a solo play so i didn't play the the competitive version but i imagine how good and clean and also cutthroat it could be if you wanted it to be 
but the mm. the basic premise of savannah park which makes it interesting and a lot deeper than uh than you'd think on first blush is you have a board of hexagonal uh a hexagonal board of hexagonal tiles and on the borders of it a couple of spaces have like some dry brush um and then in the middle there's a, a big rock and then a little bit away from the middle there are three burning trees uh, and then a little bit beyond that are a couple of regular trees um, and the, the burning trees, there's a one tree, a two tree, and a three tree. And basically, as the, the game starts, you put out all these animals. There are five different animals. There's ostriches, giraffes, rhinos, uh, elephants, and uh, uh, antelope. You put all these tiles out on the board. They either have one, two, or three of those animals. There are a couple tiles that have one of uh, two different animals, a couple of them drinking from a watering hole. Uh, there are two tiles that have three of the six animals, six animals, actually. There are two tiles that have three of the six animals. There's also zebras uh, drinking from a watering hole. And there's one tile that has all six animals drinking from a watering hole. Mm. Now, why that's important is the scoring at the end is that uh, your biggest group that scores the most points uh, gets you your point for that animal group. And the way you score mm -hmm. points is the number of uh, animals on your tiles in one contiguous group times the number of watering holes with that animal in it in that group. So sure. there are only a max of three watering holes you can get per animal because you have the big six uh, animal watering hole. You have a two animal or you have a three animal watering hole and you have a one individual animal watering hole. So you get a max of three. But what makes it interesting is it has that bingo aspect again, uh, like from number nine uh, or from tiny towns where one person in a multiplayer game picks a tile with a number of animals. because you randomly assign the tiles at the beginning to the board uh, to where every space is covered except for the trees and brush um, and the rock and then you pick one so say i pick the the two elephant everyone picks up mm -hmm. the two elephant from their board and has to put it on a different empty space that is a valid place to play and so yeah. we randomly assigned at the beginning of the game so you and i have different boards to start so the two mm -hmm. elephant for me might be the perfect position of where i need to place it but for you it might be really inconvenient at the time um, yeah. the, the burning trees make it a little more complicated because around the every space, the six spaces surrounding the, the one burning tree, any tile that surrounds it that has only one animal gets removed before scoring. Same thing with mm -hmm. the two tree if you have two animals, the three tree if you have a three animal tile, which can score you potentially a lot of points, um, those get removed before scoring. Now granted, sometimes you can strategically play it to where you put a one animal covering a tree and then it gets removed to, to reveal the tree before scoring because trees are worth three points at the end of the game. Um, and like dry brush is only worth one point. So you might like put a thing covering a tree to later remove it and get points. And that's totally valid. Um, but it's just an interesting uh, planning of, oh, if I move this here, well, then I need to move this here, but I can't do it yet because I need this to go over here. Oh, but that puts it next to a two, right next to a burning tree with a two. So it's just this very thinky, I thought it was a great solo game. And like the oh, baseboard awesome. is identical uh, boards, but you can flip to the back. You can actually design this, the, the base style. You can put the burning trees where you want them um, to make yeah. it a unique play style uh, between groups. So it was such a great game that I thoroughly enjoyed. Yeah, Savannah Park. Now for the solo mode, I actually read the rules to this because I, I've been very tempted to buy. I haven't broken down quite yet. But it's a it's a Michael Kiesling and Wolfgang Wolfgang Kramer. It's probably not how you pronounce it. Design, um, and these these two are like the dynamic duo. They they made Renature. Um, they have like a trilogy, Mask trilogy, I think is what it's called. It's kind of similar to Renature, like area control style games that are very uh, highly revered. Uh, Michael Kiesling is also the Azul designer. Uh, Watergate. Wolfgang Kramer has done El Grande. So these guys are just freaking legends. And so when they put out another game, I'm always paying attention. And this is one that interests me. It seems like a very family friendly one, but also has some good potential for, for spatial puzzle planning and such. I'm curious about the, the solo mode though. Cause I don't remember reading about that in the rules. Do you, do you pick every, every single tile like that comes next? And so you're kind of just trying to beat your own score in that sense. Yeah. And it does the typical like solo thing where like, Oh, if you get, less than 80 points you need to do better next time if you get more than 100 <laughs> points or 120 140 yeah. 60 80 or 200 those like different tiers of good job attaboy do better <laughs> next time but like it definitely yeah. is uh I, I think it's a really interesting like solo puzzle because the experience would be so mm -hmm. vastly different than the bingo style of taking turns oh, picking yeah. uh um, yeah. that no i think it's a great solo game uh, and along the family lines that you were talking about they actually have like family variant 
uh, to where you can like streamline it to make it a lot simpler for kids where you basically take out the burning trees to make it easier um, nice. for like kids to play it. So they did a lot of good attention to detail for that. And they have a couple like extra variants in the game to like add lions that can patrol around and get you extra points. And there's a variant for the, there's like three different variants in the main, in like the main box. And I'm like, just pick a, pick a mode. <laughs> yeah. And the, uh, I've seen pictures of this too. The, each player's pieces come in their own little tuck box that fit together in kind of this cute little yeah. uh, illustration. And so, yeah, I mean, capstone productions are typically very thoughtful and, and this is kind of a follow-up from their offering renature from capstone and deep print games. And so it's one I do want to try. It looks very interesting to me. So good pick. I'm glad you tried this, man. This is sweet yeah I've been, I've been looking forward to this one for a long time I, this was like my like game of the year that i really wanted to play and like oh, i've nice. been following it through caps and kept hoping it would come out kept hoping it would come out and they kept like <laughs> pushing it back and i was like come out already i want to play it totally. what's, what's your number three okay are we on three i think i have two left or did i skip one I skip one. maybe you skip one because I have, I have two left uh, one two three I've got 10, so maybe, I don't know. That's fine, though. Um, so my next one is Sprawlopolis. That's my number two Sprawl as well. Oh, let's go. <laughs> yeah, Sprawlopolis. I, was, I would be shocked, honestly, if this wasn't on your list because it's, it's such a great solo game. And, oh, my goodness, it's 18 cards, but so much game in 18 cards. I just can't mm -hmm. believe it because you got 18 cards with a grid of four spaces on each one. These spaces are different sections of city, um, like an industrial section or residential or, or the parks. And so different colors. And then you have streets running through these cards as well. And this is the part that blows my mind about this game of 18 cards is that on the back of each of these 18 cards is a unique scoring objective. And this object, it tells you like you this is how you score this type of points and it's a unique way to score points. And so it, it kind of incentivizes you to arrange these cards in a different way each game, depending on which cards come out. So you use three of those um, to set out as your scoring conditions or objectives. And then each card also has a requirement. It's like, this is how you're going to score points on me, but you need at least this many points to, uh, to win, I guess this part of the card at least, but then you add all three cards scoring requirements together and it's like that's the threshold you have to hit in points by using their scoring objectives plus some generic ones that are always in there to to win the game and this this appeals to me i don't play many solo games but this one ranks very highly in my opinion of, of the few i've tried um because it's a win or lose kind of thing and obviously you can try to smash the score and, and do even better and improve that way but usually you know if you if you're combining three different cards out of 18 every game is going to be slightly different from another and uh it's a challenging game too surprisingly like i've i've probably lost it as many times or more than i've won it and uh Sprawlopus is just cool with with how much it does with so little it's a very very impressive game and it's one that i i don't see myself ever getting rid of from my collection yeah i know for sure and i i I remember we talked about this whenever we used to game together back in person, but I definitely play oh, a lot yeah. more solo games than you do. Um, yeah. And a lot of games on my list, I've either played solo or I, or I bought them with the intent to play solo, like Tiny Towns mm -hmm. and Number 9 and uh, Savannah Park and stuff. Um, but yeah, I only played this actually for the first time like two weeks ago, but I like, it was so good. I played it like back to back to back. Uh, but I, I like flew to, a, to, to Phoenix and I brought it with me to, to just play in the hotel. Uh, and it was so good. Like you talked about, like the fact that they, the, the most impressive part about the scoring is that like they, they numbered all of the cards one to 18, but the cards that were lower numbers, like you talked about, you add them together to make the final score. The lower ones had a, such a significant risk of giving you a lot of negative points. Whereas mm -hmm. the ones that were like the 18 or the 17 or the 16 could give you like a bunch of points, like 20 something oh. points. And so the, the way they numbered the cards was also very intentional too. There was like really interesting. But yeah, no, it's a great yeah. one. There, there were some other solo games I considered for this list that I also thought were pretty like interesting thoughts. Like Palm Island, which I love as like one of my favorite solo games is like sort of spatial puzzly because it's depending on where they are in your deck um, and which way they're, the card is oriented matters. But it was a little less spatial puzzly. But yeah, no, it's definitely a great solo game and fits this list perfectly. Once you talked about it being 
uh, like arranging or stacking cards. I was like, I can't not include Sprawlopolis. Like it, <laughs> totally. it fits this category perfectly. Mm -hmm. So good. Have you tried Agro Agropolis? Like the standard? No, I haven't. I, I, I saw that that was there, but no, I haven't played it. Yeah, no, well, I only got Sprawlopolis as part of the original Tussie Mussy campaign because I was mm -hmm. riding the hype oh, of yeah, Wingspan yeah. and hopped mm -hmm. on the Elizabeth Hargrave train <laughs> and bought Tussie Mussy yeah. for the original Kickstarter. And then mm -hmm. at that time, they were offering like a couple of their like biggest designs uh, for the, the the pocket games. And so I bought Sprawlopolis because I just heard so much good things about it uh, and just never got around to playing it for one reason or another. So I still haven't actually yeah. played Tussie Mussy, ironically enough, but I'm waiting for the expansion <laughs> to come in uh for the new for the new kickstarter but yeah i know yeah. it it was great finally glad i got to play it but i'll have to check out acropolis yeah it's it's a standalone sequel i assume all the 18 cards have different scoring objectives and slightly different nuances to them but then you can combine them both and uh i i almost got in on this kickstarter but for whatever reason i didn't but i think i don't know just talking about it i'm like man why am i not playing this game more and why don't i own agropolis i don't know i don't have a good reason for you so i'm sorry everyone <laughs> um but yeah that's my second to last pick so you have you have two games left then well not anymore because sprawlopolis is my second oh, one yeah. so i got oh, one okay, left okay you got oh, one perfect. left no yeah, so perfect. yeah we're good we're good all right what's your last one oh, i'm sure you could i'm sure you could guess what it was Oh, it's a uh, reef, right? Yeah, of course, man. Reef yes. by Emerson Matsuchi, of course. man. Of course. This is like right. one of my favorite, if not my favorite game of all time. I love reef. <laughs> and once you talked about like spatial puzzles, like this fits it to a T because it's, it's 3d <laughs> spatial puzzle. It's yeah. a lot of planning. It's like, it's got that excruciating arboretum feel, which is like one of my honorable mentions is arboretum. It's got that excruciating mm -hmm. feel of, like you want to do two things at once and you can't because you want to take a mm -hmm. card from the, the pile to plan a, a, a chain of things later, but you also only have a hand limit of four, so you can't take more cards and you want to play sure. a card, but you also want to take a card before someone else can take it. It's this beautiful decision space, but the, the crux of Reef, they just did a reprinting, which I actually think is inferior to the first one, the, the new bits, <laughs> the coloring, yeah, the coloring the box, of the chunky right? plot. They changed the box art, which I thought the first mm -hmm. one looked really good. And they, they yeah, changed yeah. the coloring of the plastic bits to be a weirder color. Um, basically there's four colors of plastic bits and you're basically building a 3d coral reef. And so, uh, the, the crux of the game is on your turn. It's very simple actions. You either take a card from the, the display of like the market of three, or you, uh, play a card simple as that. Uh, if you mm -hmm. take a card from the, basically it's got that kind of like century, uh, golem edition, which, oh, that makes so much more sense. Emerson match Sushi did the century games. That makes sense yeah. why this mechanism is in it. But basically, if you don't take the first card, uh, like the, the newest card is the most expensive, the oldest card. Mm. If you skip it, you put a coin on it to take the, right. the newer card. And then you're incentivized to take the older card eventually because there's a bunch of coins on it. Um, mm. But basically, and like most coins at the end of the game wins. But basically what you do is the top of the card, there's two halves to the card. The top half of the card lets you play uh, two chunky little plastic coral bits on your board somewhere and then the bottom of the card lets you score and most of the time like 90 percent of the time the top color and the bottom color that score are entirely different colors so you have to plan ahead mm -hmm. of time uh oh i need to set out the green this time to to score the green next time when i play the purple to score the purple the following round so it's a, a lot of really intentional chaining um and you kind of set yourself up to get the best success with that um but also a lot of the scoring it's it's in a top down view um, but you can stack these to a max height of four, but different things uh, chain with different adjacencies. So like some of the scoring might be uh, everything that's uh, in an orthogonal or diagonal direction scores a point. Or if you have two, uh, two height uh, green, that scores you four points. Or if you have two three height, uh, or for every three height uh, purple you have, you get three points. So like, depending on how you orient your shapes and things, you're kind of planning ahead to score different stuff at different times and chain the things on top of each other. It's just such a beautiful design of 3D abstract strategy that really there isn't much of that I've seen. And um, I thought it just did such a great job. And of course, it's in that plan B line. This is one of the earlier ones because they had just come out with Azul, then they did Reef, and then they went yeah. with all the other Azuls and all the other plan B things. So this was like on the earlier side of that. And I just think it's so great. Yeah. 
I've only played Reef one time, and for whatever reason, it didn't click for me. So every time, every time I remember this is like your favorite game, I'm like, man, I must have missed something here. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I only, you know, you have way more plays of it than I do. So um, you were, you're definitely the expert in this uh, scenario. But I guess I don't know for me if it just wasn't as mean as Azul, and so I was like, mm. oh, it's, it's it's very much not a mean game. Really, the only like interaction <laughs> is just if I take the card that you need. But mm. if I take it and I don't need it, then I just wasted a turn drawing a card I didn't need. Um, right. Or if I take the card that has right. a bunch of coins on it before you do, like really, it's pretty minimal. It's like async. It's like simultaneous play. Um, it, it's it's a very minimal interaction for sure. Yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm pretty harsh on games that don't have a lot of interaction, <laughs> as a lot of people probably know by now. But um, yeah, this is a great uh, a great pick because it is quite popular in the uh, abstract and spatial puzzle category. So um, there are a lot of people to like, including Ryan. So there you have it. <laughs> Good choice. Okay, my last one. I'm, I'm curious to hear how much you know about this. Have you heard of My City? Um, My City. Is that the new uh, Legacy game? Yes. 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 No, I heard about it, yeah. Yeah, this... I don't know, just having this conversation today... It's a polyomino game, but it might be one of those exceptions to the rule where where it could potentially break through as one that you enjoy. Just it's the Canizia, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And this is a game that I thought I wouldn't enjoy <laughs> when I first <laughs> heard about it because it's it's bingo style where there's a deck of cards that matches the exact same set of tiles that everybody starts with in the game. And you just flip one and that's what everybody has to place on their turn. So there's basically no interaction, at least to start out. And it's a legacy game, which I've kind of, you know, not had great run-ins with legacy games up to this point. Like, I played a few, like Pandemic Legacy and Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion that started out, and it was like, yeah, this is enjoyable. This is cool. It's evolving. And then over time, it's just like, this is so much work. Like, what, yeah, what did it, they add? It, it becomes like an obligation to finish it for the sake of <laughs> yeah. finishing it. I feel like that's like the board game oh. community as a whole, though. It's like everyone is like, initially, Legacy was such this cool, hot thing. And now everyone's just like, mm-hmm. Ugh, a Legacy? Do I really have to play 12 games of this to get the full experience? Yeah, yeah it's a commitment. And uh, and the, the rules pile on. And then you're like, what did they add last time? Or like, where, where <laughs> did they give off in the story? And it's just so hard to track, especially if you don't play it regularly. And then, yeah, it starts to feel more like an obligation than like, oh, I'm excited to play this again. It's like, oh, I better, I better get back to this game. You know? <laughs> but My City totally broke the mold because like the low interaction and the legacy aspects were like um, over, overshadowed or I guess, you know, the, the strengths of them were brought out in this game because Kinesia just boils it down to, to like pure mechanical bliss. And <laughs> I thought that like restricting you know, when you're placing out tiles, I thought that that restriction of like, oh, you can't place out anything you want wherever you want and plan it out. You have to place out this one next because that's what the deck says. I thought that would be kind of lame and like just monotonous. Like, but actually what it does is it creates all this tension because um, your, your set of tiles is the same every time you play and you're seeing what your remaining options are as they dwindle mm-hmm. and you're putting stuff out. And then you're seeing as your space constricts, like what can I fit into here? And then you're trying to plan out like, Oh shoot, where do I fit this tile? And like, how do I leave space for it? Because when you put out a tile, it has to connect one that's already on the board. And then on top of that, every new chapter um, or new episode, there's like 24 episodes, which sounds like a lot, but these games go pretty quickly. They're like 20, 30 minutes. This is a legacy game that you can beat because um unlike unlike every other legacy game i've ever played and unlike a lot of board games it's one that's so easy to get to the table you you break it open you pull out your own tiles you dump them out you put down your board you shuffle the deck you're ready to go you're like almost instantly jumping into it so even if you don't have energy like some nights for my wife and i we were like let's play my city (laughs) and then instead of just playing one round we would play two or three because it's so addicting and the way it evolves over time and and the way it subtly changes it's just like Reiner throws in one new rule with a new chapter and it sounds so subtle, but then when you start playing, you're like, Oh my gosh, this changes literally everything that I knew about the game. Like my whole strategy is just out the window. And so it just keeps you on your toes. And I don't know, I've, I've talked way too much about my city on our podcast. (laughs) So I've probably like made 
all of our listeners gloss over at this point. But I would say if there's any polyomino game, you got to give a shot. Based on what you like about all your spatial puzzle games, I would recommend My City. So Okay, I'll have to check it out. I will say, though, the, the part that makes me a little wary of it is the the legacy competitive game aspect of it. Like, mm, I, my, yeah. my friend and I, who uh, I played a lot of board games back with in Texas before I moved here, um, we uh, got through, like, half the campaign of Charter Stone, which is a competitive oh, yeah. legacy game that both of us bounced pretty hard off of. Like we got through like half of it and they were just like, this is so like boring. And like, it, it's, it's very much like me being a pediatrician, the best thing I can equate it to is like trying to discipline like a two or three year old. Like the, it, it's hard to grasp or like give a reward to a two or three year old. Like they just can't grasp the, the, if it's not immediate, like, yeah, I could say, oh, we're going to go get ice cream on Friday and it's Monday. They don't remember what happened, what's going to be in four days. They don't remember what they did 10 minutes ago, much less that. So like for a legacy competitive, it has that same aspect of, yeah, if we do nine or 12 games of this, like, yeah, eventually someone's going to be an ultimate winner, but like the, the, the slight winning along the way, it's kind of like, how much does this actually matter for the final game? Or, or if we did 10 games and I've already won eight of them, are we just arbitrarily playing the last few? Like that's, what's kind of a, a turnoff for me. And I don't know how much that addresses that in this game. Yeah, I can see that, especially if somebody has a huge lead and it's like, well, what's the point in us finishing? You know, we're just it's obligation again. Right. I do think this one, you know, they're they're because it's so low interaction, though, um, like really there is a little bit later on that you're kind of like racing to complete stuff in, in later mechanisms in the game. But um, because it's so low interaction, you just kind of compare points at the end. Um, to me, it felt like each individual victory was, was substantial. It wasn't like we were building, I mean, obviously, you know, from an ego standpoint, it's like, I got to win this whole thing, but each, each victory on its own was very satisfying. But the other thing that I think this, this game does very well from, from, as you say, a competitive legacy standpoint is the winner actually has to add typically more rocks or more challenging aspects to their own board Mm. that hurts their scoring potential in the next game. And it's, it's just like more that they have to deal with. And, and so really in, in some ways the challenge ramps up for people who keep dominating. Whereas for those who, who lose, whether it's one or multiple times, they, at the end of each game, they earn stickers and bonuses and stuff onto their board that actually helps them um, score better. So from, from our experience, it kept it rather competitive till pretty close to the end um, in that sense, because it's like, if I was, if, if I was, if I was on a hot streak, then my board was just getting harder and harder to deal with, with each game and it, it ramped up the challenge. And so it kind of kept the, the playing field level, whether I was, you know, doing better at that point or not. So well, I guess I, does I that, that have part... the problem of like a power grid problem where you're like incentivized to lose or like to lose until like the right time? Does it have that kind of swinginess incentive in like a weird way? I don't think so because you, you also, if you win the game, then you get kind of points or nicks towards the ultimate victory. Gotcha. And so there, there actually were a couple interesting later games though, where, where there are like secondary objectives that you're trying to compete where I suddenly saw like, Oh, this secondary objective, I'm going to prioritize over winning this specific game. And uh, cause I think it's going to help me get more points in the long run. And so I don't, I don't think that was necessarily a negative. Maybe for some people it is, but, but it was just like, it was cool that I could prioritize that secondary objective, which would help me over the course of multiple games over winning just this, this specific game. So, um, no, it, I mean, my city, I love it. Um, I see that they've announced a roll and write version of this. Well, of maybe they haven't officially they have. announced it. <laughs> yeah. Classic Reiner just taking a popular game and, and turning it into a slightly different mechanical game. But, uh, yeah, I talked to him about like, are you doing a sequel to this or what? And he's like, I'm doing something different, but I think I think it's gonna a lot of people are gonna like it. So it looks like it's my city, the Roll and Write, um, which will likely break the mold for me again because I've grown really tired of Roll and Writes lately. But if any if any game can uh, overcome my biases, it's my city somehow. So <laughs> that's my last recommendation. So cool. There's there's ten games from each of us, more than ten because we cheated, but. Uh, <laughs> of spatial puzzle recommendations. I think this is an excellent list to work with. If you're looking for like, what's the next game I should get? What's the introductory game or what's the deep meaty game? I mean, we, we covered a wide spectrum here. Uh, yeah. For I think wide... there were, there were a couple though that I did want to mention as like honorable oh, yeah. mentions that I was like debating oh, between. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
uh, I'm curious if we have the same ones on here because these are two of the these three are like light like intro games that a lot of people might have played already as intro games. Uh, I had Santorini on here, which is like the obvious oh. spatial puzzle pick that I was like, w- once we yeah. talked about like stacking things in spatial puzzle, like this is like quintessential too. It's like 3D Connect totally. 4 basically. Like how can you not include yeah. that on here? It's a great choice. Yeah. No, I, I didn't include that just because I didn't think of it, but that's an awesome choice. I um Yeah, I have seven of them. Do, do you want to go through yours first or you want? Sure. Yeah, I had, I had a couple. So Santorini was one, King Domino. Oh. Um, yes. Mm-hmm. Part of why I didn't include King Domino is because I, I think King Domino has a pretty limited shelf life on its own, but I just bought Definitely, King Domino yeah. Origins. I actually got rid of regular King Domino because I think King Domino Origins will solve a lot of those problems um, mm-hmm. of allowing it to be, uh, you can still have the base King Domino experience if you're like introducing it to people who don't play as much games, but you have that like okay. option to make it more gamery and gamify it. Not to the same yeah. like complexity of Queen Domino, but like you can add in one of the two like modules to make it more difficult and gamery um, that I think will make it have a little bit longer shelf life, but I haven't played it yet. So I didn't include it. Um, and then Arboretum, like I talked about, like the spatial puzzle aspect of it isn't as much of the crux of it. Like, yeah, it's there. Like you have to make a, a line of trees in a ascending numerical order. But other than that, a lot of the crux of Arboretum is the, the hate drafting and uh, mm-hmm. almost just like maybe I can score one tree maybe two if I'm lucky but really the whole point of my hand is to make other people not score and so <laughs> it's such a mean game this was on my list too I, I love Arboretum but yeah it's the spatial aspect is very very uh subtle but it's there which is why it's on my list too honorable mention Good choice. yeah for sure the the other ones I had thought of that I was like they don't have as much of a component of the spatial aspect it's like Lisboa with the city off to the side I don't know if you have you played Lisboa um i played why can't i remember this i played a lacerda recently and i think it was lisboa but i i did not yeah it was lisboa (laughs) i i think it's because i think it's partially because i just was just so overwhelmed with the rules um (laughs) teach of it but i was just like i hate this game (laughs) but which which is funny um, because i think lisboa is often touted as like one of the like most streamlined of the uh, like the easiest to get into rather i will say the rules are pretty dense but that's like lacerda in a nutshell but like but but you know what i'm talking about that like side city board where you're like building like the little kiosk things like in the rows and Uh columns like that definitely has like a spatial puzzly at like spot to it but that's not really like yeah. the crux of the like, yeah it is like a, a significant portion but there's like so much else to the lacerda aspect of it of course that yeah i yeah, couldn't absolutely. really like feasibly add it uh the mm-hmm. other ones i <laughs> thought of were um uh, smartphone ink with like the layering of your like uh, action selection oh, yeah. mechanism like i was yeah, like cool. th- there's like the spatial puzzle like, puzzle of that but like aside that's from that it's name. really not much of a spatial puzzle beyond that so I, I, I didn't think in good faith I could add that to like the crux of the game list. Um, <laughs> right. And another one that I expect to be good that I haven't played yet is Dinosaur World uh, that I bought at Origins that I want to play. Nice. Um, yeah. Dinosaur World is like you add the hexagonal things in, a, in a, a line as well. But again, that's not really the crux of the game either. It's a lot of the like mm-hmm. dice drafting and work replacement things. Um, and the last one I was thinking of uh, that was a, a decent thought, well, I guess two, uh, was Suro, which is uh, pretty bare bones and simple tile placement with like paths. Um, okay. But then also Tosh Kalar, which I recently started playing that I really enjoy, which is also a pretty abstract strategy, kind of like Tiny Towns esque, where you like place some things out and then eventually cash them in for one big thing. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be interested to try some of these that I haven't and uh, some good honorable mentions. Mine are I, I put on blockus that's one that i enjoyed mm. playing way back in the day i haven't played it in ages but i still own this game for some reason and even though the box is just totally thrashed because <laughs> i i lugged it around back when i was super young but that's kind of a classic um stri- strategy game there um with polyominoes that you're trying to cut people off and section off your own areas um, I did put Calico and Cascadia on here. You mentioned Cascadia. Calico is from the same team and uh, a similar vibe to it with drafting and, and puzzling things out. We did mention it earlier. I had Arboretum. Um, Railroad Inc. Is, mm, yep, I consider that one too. Yeah, it's one that we uh, played quite a bit of back when we were hot on rolling rights at my house. And uh, it's still one I think is a really solid game and would recommend to people. 
Um, I had Baron Park on here. Uh, I was surprised you didn't put Baron Park on there because you were the one who introduced me to it. I figured whenever I mentioned oh, yeah, Llama yeah, Land yeah. with Philip Walker Harding, I figured, oh, he's for sure going to have Baron Park. So <laughs> I like didn't even mention it. Yeah, I did an article a while back, Battle of the Polyominoes, where I ranked Baron Park and Patchwork in New York Zoo in my city against each other. And Baron Park actually came out like way beneath the other three <laughs> hmm. after I like analyzed them deeply. And I think, I think after I played Baron Park three or four times, I just felt like I wasn't finding new things to explore st strategic wise. And like, I was kind of, it was kind of feeling samey after that. And that, um, that kind of happens with me with certain games and it can kill them pretty quickly where I, I did get rid of it from my collection, but I still think it's, it's a good time. A lot of people really love this game and it's got bears. So, I mean, <laughs> come on, you can't go wrong with that as a, as an option to look into. Uh, my other two were on tour. Oh, great um, one. Yeah, I yeah. guess I, I was considering that, but I didn't think it was as spatial puzzly. I mean, I guess it's yeah. depending on where you put the things when. Yeah, I guess mm -hmm. there is some spatially puzzliness to it, but great roll and write. Yeah, yeah, it's a fun one too. It's it's one of those roll and writes that feels more partyish or festive, or it's like you're getting everybody together and like let's plan our tours and got big chunky dice and cards and stuff. So, yeah, that's a fun one. Um, and then Sagrada, which is yeah, came out around Azul and, and kind of similar in style where you're, you're drafting dice and organizing them on a stained glass window in, in certain ways to score points. And so that's actually one of my wife's favorite games. And I recently sold it. <laughs> I think she's still a little salty <laughs> well, about hey, that. You can but... rebuy it. Speaking of legacy, they're doing a Sagrada <laughs> legacy. Oh my gosh. I'm, I'm actually really excited. I actually like Sagrada. I think it's actually a really good solo game too, but yeah, I'm, I'm actually excited for the legacy of it. Yeah, it'll be interesting to hear and see what that's like. So, of course, there's a legacy version. I can see that working well, though, potentially. I don't know. Maybe if they follow yeah. the My City style where where new challenges come each time. And that would be interesting. Um, yeah, so those are my honorable mentions. But that isn't the last game I wanted to talk about. I don't know if I mentioned this at all to you when, when I invited you to join this podcast, which thank you, by the way, for joining. This has been a pleasure to, to see you again, Ryan, and chat games, of course. <laughs> yeah, man. Thanks for having me on. It's a, it's been too long since we've gotten to to chat and catch up. And I feel like the the more we've talked, the more we're just like slipping into our old conversations of talking about oh, the totally. stuff we used to talk about. It's been great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm uh, hoping to go visit Origins. Although by the time I get to Origins, you may be gone. So I don't know where we're going to game again soon, but hopefully sooner than later. But um, one of the, one of the things that made me think of you besides just, you know, your enjoyment of spatial puzzles was uh, this, this last topic I wanted to cover. And this is, I, I wanted to introduce the next board game that we are actually going to publish because it has some ties to you, Ryan. And so I don't think this game would actually exist in its, in its, it, it does, it would of course exist without me <laughs> and without you, but in its specific form, it wouldn't exist without your help, Ryan. So I think it's fitting that you're the first one to to find out outside of you know Bitewing Games and its close compatriots. Um, I don't even know what compatriot means, but that <laughs> feels like a fitting word. So, anyways, our next game that we're planning to bring to Kickstarter in the spring. Here it is. I'm just gonna read you the description so I don't I don't butcher this or get lost <laughs> on a side tangent. So it is a spatial puzzle game, um, but it's also a love letter to outdoor adventuring. This game is going to be called Trailblazers by designer Ryan Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. All right. So let me read you this description. Okay. So, and then you're, you're, you're free to ask some questions after if anything comes to mind. So Trailblazers are the gutsy folks who pave and brave the trails of the great outdoors, whether by hiking boots, cycling wheels, or river paddle. These tenacious travelers seek to find their insatiable appetite, seek to feed their insatiable appetite for adventure. With a scenic wilderness ever ahead and a freshly charted path upon the heels, one mustn't forget to eventually find their way back to camp. For there are always new environments to explore, further expeditions to undertake, and more trails to blaze. In Trailblazers, players compete to earn the most points by building biking, hiking, and kayaking loops from their campsites of the matching trail type. Each round, players are dealt eight trail cards where they'll draft two cards, arrange those cards in their personal area, and pass their hand to the next player three times. Cards must either be placed adjacent to or overlapping other cards. While players can push their luck by aiming to construct long and elaborate trails, 
Only closed loops that start and end at a matching campsite will score points. Players also compete to fulfill first two and end game skull, goal cards. Uh, not skull cards, goal cards. <laughs> <laughs> After four rounds, the game ends and the player with the most points from closed loops and goal cards wins. Uh, compared to the travel edition, there will be a travel edition to this for one to four players. The standard edition of trailblazers features a second deck of trail and player cards. So you can play with up to eight players. This has a huge range of one to eight. Okay. Uh, the box also contains two expansions, the animals expansion and the adventurers expansion that add another challenging layer of strategy and objectives to the experience. So trailblazers is the third spatial puzzle domino game designed by Ryan Courtney. The first two being Pipeline and Curious Cargo, which we talked about in this episode, because guess what? I love those games. I reached out to Ryan, and he happened to be making a third one of this type. <laughs> and it's actually a really good fit for our, you know, our Bartwing, Bartwing Games brand. And it's something that we're very passionate about thematically and, and such. So we're very excited for this. So while, while these games share a similar puzzly DNA that fans have come to know and love, Trailblazers differs by the following. It features simple... Highly accessible rules in a 30-minute game for one to eight players. I think a lot of people who who are fans of Ryan Courtney or have tried his game, this is going to blow their mind because it's, like, dead simple. And I'm, I'm not kidding you here. Like, I've gone to Ryan and been like, what if we what if we add in this part? Like, this is kind of interesting, right? And he's like, no, nah, we got to keep it streamlined <laughs> every time. <laughs> Every time I introduce something to him. And uh, so he's very focused on making this very approachable for everyone, like way, 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 way more approachable than Curious Cargo and Pipeline, but also still satisfying spatially uh, for people who are fans of his games. Um, so it's different in other ways, too. It boils down the gameplay to pure spatial puzzling and card drafting with a dash of push your luck route building. Um, we're, we're hoping, and we're, we're currently planning to use durable PVC plastic cards that can easily be shuffled, dealt, drafted, and overlapped. Um, but this, these will likely be in the travel edition and the deluxe edition of the game. Um, uh, because the other two games, they use tiles, right? And Curious Cargo, you can actually stack tiles on top of each other. Oops, sorry. You can stack tiles on top of each other and you can put scaffolding underneath so they're not, you know, slanted. But in this one, you, you can actually, and you probably will be doing a lot more stacking and, and kind of changing things you've already laid down. And so using cards and there's tons of drafting, there are tons of cards in this game. So <laughs> it felt like a good fit, but with the PVC, I think it'll be a really nice touch. And finally, this game includes three challenging solo modes with a high skill ceiling. And these are ones that like, I know a lot of games come with like, Hey, let's hit this stretch goal. And then we'll just come up with a solo mode, you know, last minute. But these are, and you can ask Ryan himself, he, he will be adamant about this, but these are three solo modes that he's like put just as much passion, if not an effort, if not more into compared to the base game where you can play with two to eight players. Um, and I've tried some of them and they are actually really satisfying. I'm not much of a solo, solo gamer, but um, the, the latest one that I've tried, uh, I got hooked on <laughs> and I was like, man, I got to beat this. <laughs> so uh yeah, there you have it, uh, Trailblazers. It's nice to, to get that off my chest from Ryan Courtney. And I know he's been really anxious for us to announce this as well. We, uh, we are working with an artist to on, on the initial concept art right now. that We don't have anything yet to show or even that we've seen. <laughs> but I think it's going to look really nice and it's going to be a nice production. But do you have any questions or, or what's your reaction to this announcement of Trailblazers? Yeah, I mean, I think 99% of it sounded super interesting. I think the, uh, the you, you had me until I, I realized there was a significant lack of oil. And I think if I'm coming to a Ryan Courtney <laughs> game, I need there to be pipelines uh, of oil, even if it's in the pipes. wilderness. I think that's the 1% that's missing. <laughs> but no, in all seriousness, no, that sounds super awesome. I mean, it's got a lot of stuff I really like in games, like drafting. It sounds like it's got that significant, like, sprawlopolis feel of, like, overlapping and also, like, having, like, a closed, tight loop. Um, no, that sounds awesome. And if it's got Ryan Courtney behind it and you guys, I'm in, man, that sounds awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And it's been really interesting because Ryan's still been working on like kind of the last modes. Cause when he introduced it to me initially, there were, there was like one mode with a single expansion and, uh, and then there was a separate solo mode as well. And I started pushing him. I'm like, Ryan, this is a hiking, biking, kayaking game. We got to get hikers and bikers and kayakers in here, like actual traveling <laughs> figures that, that take these trails. Um, and he, over time, he's figured out another expansion. And I would, I would 
compare this most similarly this, as far as expansions goes to something like railroad Inc where it's like you don't really combine them all together mm -hmm. it's more like you you pick one of them and it changes the feel of the game a bit and it's interesting because like one of one of them is is maybe simpler but it's also more cutthroat and and a lot more opportunity for like watching what people are taking and hate drafting like kind of like Azul. <laughs> Whereas um, the core one, I would say, is more focused on like the spatial puzzle and, and trying to optimize your trails and such and build loops and it's not nearly as mean. And so with the different options in both the solo and, and multiplayer modes, I think there's going to be a, a flavor for everyone. Me personally, I enjoy trying all of them because they're all just like, you know, I love ice cream. They're like different flavors of ice cream. You know, I'm happy to eat them all or put them all in the same bowl. I mean, not at once, but, you know. <laughs> one at a time individually but um yeah any any other i don't know thoughts about this yeah i guess like what's the the main difference between like the travel and the not travel yeah so oh okay so this is something that we, we've been pushing to do for a while now um is kind of the the packaging of this this game especially the travel edition because just thinking about it like ryan really wanted this to be a game that was like pretty affordable and that you could essentially like fit in your pocket and just carry around anywhere you wanted and, and break out kind of like Sprawlopolis, but like the travel edition is still going to have like 140 cards. And <laughs> <laughs> so I, it, actually it's probably like 180 cards. I mean, they're domino shaped and they're smaller, but like it's definitely not Sprawlopolis in the, in content that's it's in there, but uh, still something like it could be small and it could be something you could transport around. And I was just like, I don't know. Like, Cause we, we need to, he also wanted to put like tons of animal figures in this game. And it was like, how do we make this meet? And so we figured it out. We, we figured out we're going to do a travel edition, which will have a, we're aiming to get, use a clamshell hard shell case that has a carabiner. And it looks like something you would attach to a hiking bike backpack or a kayaking, <laughs> your kayak or uh, your bike or whatever. And because all the components inside, you know, the cards are plastic, it's essentially waterproof. And so it's a hiking, biking, kayaking game that you can take hiking, biking, and kayaking. And the travel edition will just have cards and the rule book. And uh, you can play with one to four players. You can play the main mode. You can play a solo version of that main mode. And that's what you can play with the travel edition. And then there will be a standard and deluxe edition. The deluxe edition is basically just the travel edition plus the standard edition. But the standard is it, it has the two expansions, the animals, which is like, Imagine New York Zoo. This is kind of somewhat our inspiration for this. Just a big old tray of animals. <laughs> <laughs> Tons of animals that will come in this. And they, they're part of the, the gameplay there. As well as traveling figures. A hiker, biker, and kayaker that each player gets. And little campsites that or campfires that they you know put out along their trail along the way as they're moving along it. So there's, there's more expansions. And then there's an epic solo mode. Oh, this is insane. So this is a 30-minute game. But Ryan has, and uh, Tim, which is uh, – Tim has helped Ryan design uh, Pipeline Curious Cargo, and, and he has some of his own designs that I believe will be published soon. So Tim Kaiser is one to, to keep an eye out for because he, he has a lot of uh, – a lot of his DNA is, is in Ryan Courtney's games. But uh, they've been working on an epic solo mode where you combine both player decks – <laughs> you, I think you use them both and you use the animals expansion and, and where the regular game is 30 minutes and, and most of the expansion games are 30 minutes. This one is supposed to be 60 to 90 minutes <laughs> <laughs> and you just build this ginormous uh, labyrinth of trails, hiking, biking and kayaking trails. And it's so challenging. This is the one that I got hooked on and I was like, I got to get to stage two because there's three stages to it. If you don't uh, complete the requirement by the end of the first stage, then you just automatically fail. But if you win the first stage, then it's like, that feels good. That's an accomplishment in and of itself. And then if you want, you can continue on to stages two and three, which just gets even crazier. So this is a deep well here. And uh, yeah, you can play that in the standard mode. The deluxe edition will come with both the travel case and the all plastic cards, which is like almost 300 at this point or more. <laughs> Whereas the standard edition will just be regular cards. It'll be a little more affordable and it won't come with the extra. It'll just be in a regular box. Um, it won't come with the extra travel case. So we'll have options for people. Um, does that answer most of your questions for now? Yeah, man, for sure. No, I love the theme. My, my best friend just finished hiking the Pacific Crest Trail like a month ago. And so oh, nice. I, the, the concept of this big hiking theme is something super cool. Yeah, I'm super excited about it. Just like just from like putting it in an actual hiking case that hopefully will look like, you know, something you would take hiking with you to uh, 
just the theme and, and getting that Ryan Courtney goodness down to its pureness. Cause I know a lot of people bounced off of curious cargo, which I think is a great game. I, I have great things to say about it. A lot of people I think expected it to just be pure, simple spatial puzzle part of pipeline when instead he just like cranked <laughs> it up to 20 and added in these other layers too, of just like back and forth truck shipping and stuff. And whereas, um, uh, Trailblazers is what I think a lot of people were expecting from Curious Cargo to be like an approachable game. You can show your mom or your cousin, and, and even if they're not a gamer. And the thing that's interesting about this is like I can be an expert at this game and be pushing my luck to build this really elaborate trail. But if I don't close the loop, I don't get the points for that trail. And so it's like the, the people who are experienced are going to be pushing their luck and they may not hit it, but it's a 30 minute game. So what if you, if you epically fail? <laughs> Um, whereas others, you know, if they're newer to the game, they may play it safer and still be competitive. And so I think there's a lot of interesting strengths to this game and we're very excited to, uh, reveal more over time, but, uh, yeah, it's fun to announce it, especially with you here, Ryan. So thank you for introducing pipeline <laughs> and Ryan Courtney designs to me because I don't know, somehow, you know, it pushed over the first domino that led us here to trailblazers. And yeah, we are signed to publish this with Ryan and he's excited about it and we are super excited about it. So look out for it in the spring. Um, we got to deliver our criminal capers games first and, and make sure those are top notch before, you know, really focusing in our marketing and such on this next one. So it'll probably be after that, but hopefully maybe by May or June, we are doing a Kickstarter campaign for this. So, uh, but in the meantime, I, you have Tabletop Simulator, right? Yeah. Yeah, so this is one that is available on Tabletop Simulator. Ryan Courtney has his own playtest group on Discord that he's having people try all kinds of games in there. I've tried out a few other ones, and they're, they're very interesting and fun to, to go with. And so he has an active group there. They've been testing out um, all, all the modes of Trailblazers up to this point, and so they've helped make it what it is. Shout out to those um, ladies and gents. And... Uh, yeah, I think we're going to try to get a lot of solo gamers and, and non-solo gamers in on playing t uh, Trailblazers before it even hits Kickstarter on Tabletop Simulator and stuff. So if you subscribe to our newsletter at BiteWingGames.com, we'll keep you in the loop. Um, and you can feel free to reach out to me as well if you'd like to get in on Ryan's Discord and you don't know where to find it um, because there's lots of fun things to help him test out. Um, he also got a new job at uh, the Blinks by Move38 or something company um those really cool magnetic electronic things and so he's testing out those games he's testing out trailblazers he's testing out stuff for capstone that he's you know expansions and other stuff and <clears throat> totally new designs that haven't been signed yet so uh yeah uh if you're interested follow along and please join our, our newsletter we we share things like this podcast episode to keep you up to date on and and you know upcoming concept art that's going to be going to our our email subscribers as well for trailblazers so a lot of exciting things to look forward to but uh, Ryan, thanks again for joining. I think we're going to have to do this again. I mean, you have 300 games and a lot to say about them. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. We'll have to think up what our next topic will be next time we, we gather. But I know it's pretty late for you now over in Ohio, two hours ahead of me. So thank you for joining. Yeah, man. Thanks again for having me. It was great catching up. I'd be happy to come on again. Great. Great. Yeah, let's, let's do it before too long for sure. Well, there you have it. Another episode in the books. And it turns out that I actually did forget to mention one game that was on my list. I accidentally skipped it. It was Factory Funner. Uh, <laughs> whoops. But I do talk about it a little bit on the blog post version of this episode. So you can go check it out at buywingames.com. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter. This is how we'll keep you up to date on Trailblazers and everything else we're up to. Thanks again for tuning in. My name is Nick Murray, and you've been listening to the Bywing Games Podcast.